All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Carrie. Okay. I'm just looking at the attendee list. It looks like we have 10 attendees at the moment. Um, out of respect for everyone's time, we'll go ahead and, and get started uh, with the presentation here. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the presentation this evening. We have H3 Design Studio with us this evening, Tim Brian and John Hole, and they are going to go through the presentation and really lay out the design and development guidelines that have been put together for the downtown core area. This is an effort that started really in earnest uh, back in the early spring uh, in March, uh, might've been even late February, but uh, anyhow, we, we had a number of meetings, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings early on. Uh, after that, uh, there was a steering committee that was put together uh, that really worked on this project um, uh, over the last few months and have been really, really involved with representatives from the development community, adjacent neighborhoods, um, and also the plan commission. Um, as a result of that work uh, and some other meetings, some joint meetings between the Board of Aldermen and the Plan Commission, uh, we've gotten to where we are tonight. So tonight there will be a presentation from H3 that will probably take about 30 minutes or so, and then we're gonna open this up for question and answer. We're also recording this session and we're gonna take a recording of, of the proceedings this evening. We're going to put that on the city's website along with an opportunity for additional public comment for those that couldn't be in attendance this evening uh, to watch the presentation as it happens live. With this feedback and compile it, uh, we'll then have to go to the plan commission uh, and the board of aldermen for any types of approvals uh, or changes to the zoning regulations. Um, and that will also require a public hearing as we go through that process. So I just wanna make it clear that this isn't the only opportunity for public comment. Uh, there will be an open public comment period immediately following this presentation and then again as this goes through the process to be formalized uh, so with that introduction i'll go ahead and, and turn it over to tim uh, to walk through the presentation thank you david and thank you everyone for joining us this evening so what we'd like to do tonight um, as as david mentioned um, is to present kind of a summary overview of the draft um, development standards and design guidelines Tonight, we're gonna to focus on the development standards um, and we, we will be providing additional information um, to the city for uh, hosting on their website that, that uh, folks can view uh, separately to get more information on the, um, on the design guidelines themselves, which are a lot, uh, a lot more lengthy. Um, but again, the, the, the purpose of the meeting tonight is really to um, present and collect comments um, on the, uh, the development standards and design guidelines with a, a focus on the development standards. And as David mentioned, um, we've uh, been working with the city and some representative groups um, since uh, earlier this year, really the beginning of this year. Um, and there have been a number of, um, of sessions with the steering committee you can, that you can see here. Um, and most recently, we, we had two um, joint work sessions um, between the Board of Aldermen and the Planning Commission Architectural Review Board, which were um, open public sessions on October 23rd and November 11th. Um, also, just to reiterate, as, as David had mentioned, um, after tonight's meeting, we will be um, providing this presentation uh, as well as the longer supporting presentations um, with additional detail on the design guidelines to the city um, for, for posting on the website. And then we will be working with the uh, comments that we collected um, to begin to prepare the final draft of the development standards and design guidelines uh, document, which um, we will present to the Board of Aldermen, uh, Planning Commission, Architectural Review Board um, as and then as David mentioned, there will be a, a, a public hearing process and, and um, public comment period on those as part of the adoption process. So we wanted to begin tonight, um, since this may be the first exposure that some of you have had to this project, um, with just a brief summary of, of how this project came to be and what, what is the intent um, for updating the development standards and design guidelines. So the area in question, um, you can see here on the map, it's currently referred to as uh, the 
downtown core overlay district, which you see in blue, and the central business district core overlay district, which you see in purple. And in addition to those two zoning overlays, there's also an entertainment overlay, um, which you see there in kind of the, the black hatch. And so the study area, um, which is kind of broadly outlined in the red line here, is really gover governed by five different sets of regulations. There's also two planned unit developments or PUDs that have been con uh, con built or are currently being built in the area. That would be the Ceylon development at the corner of North Central and, and Maryland and the new Forsyth Point development, which is currently under construction. Uh, per the current zoning, um, there's also some inconsistency in terms of parcel orientation, what's defined as sort of the front versus the side of the parcel. Um, there uh, are a number of service alleys and other parking lots that access onto primary commercial streets and therefore interrupt um, that consistent uh, street character. Um, the parking requirements in the area often determine the density and feasibility of projects. And any PUD proposals change the geographic boundaries um, of those overlays because when a, a property is rezoned as a PUD, in the, as in the case of Ceylon, it's actually removed from the overlays. Therefore, subsequent development, if that project were, if that parcel were to be redeveloped um, at some point in the future, the, the overlays would no longer apply. So again, there's a, there's a complexity and a, a lack of clarity in terms of um, these different overlay districts, how these districts work together, and really how they, how they fit into the broader context of the vision for downtown and this particular area of downtown that's articulated in the downtown master plan. And so because of these, um, these various um, uh, potential conflicts that exist. Um, there have been some issues over time uh, with developments that are viewed as not really being contributing to this vision. Um, notably, the original development that was proposed by HBE uh, for this uh, half block fronting Maryland between uh, North Central and North Bemiston. So why update the standards? Well, there were really three points um, that we were asked to consider. First, the current zoning overlay regulations um, don't really match the vision um, of the downtown master plan and the entertainment overlay district. Um, the current height restrictions within the overlays, um, which are uh, four stories and seven stories respectively, um, don't meet the current market demand for development, for feasible development projects in downtown Clayton. So what this does is it by, by default, it forces developers to use the planned unit development tool, which has its benefits, but it also circumvents the overlay regulations. And so when PUDs come through, they're not subject to the same regulations that would occur if the project was built under the zoning overlay code. And finally, there was a feeling um, uh, by the city that the current regulations don't provide sufficient and consistent guidance to developers and to the Planning Commission Architectural Review Board when it comes to reviewing um, issues of design in projects. And so there was a desire to strengthen that in order to ensure that developments are of a high quality and contribute to that, that vision and that feel that is desired for this particular area of downtown, which is kind of your primary entertainment and dining area and is really viewed as kind of the, the, the last remaining portion of old downtown Clayton. So in order to do that, um, we've actually looked at developing uh, or creating both draft development standards and design guidelines. And, and the, these are terminologies that, that deal with slightly different aspects of, of the design of projects. So starting with the development standards, which is what we're gonna be focus on, focusing on tonight. Um, these are standards that govern uh, the placement configuration, height and bulk 
of what we would refer to as the maximum and minimum building envelope. So how big a building can be, where it can be located on the site, what are the setbacks and step backs and other things that, that, that deal with kind of the overall massing of the building. And development standards are regulatory. They're, they're like the zoning code, but they, they deal more with form uh, as opposed to simple land use. Then design guidelines are really focused on fostering design excellence and the identity and character of the district at the scale of buildings, landscape, and open space. Design guidelines can be either regulatory, like a zoning code, where they're actually required, projects are required to meet them, or they can be advisory, um, where they function as criteria by which a project is reviewed, but they're not required um, they're, they're not legally required, a project isn't legally required to, uh, to fulfill them. They, both of these, the development standards and design guidelines are, are integral components in the creation of this vibrant entertainment district because they, they really define not only the building and the appearance of the building, but also how the building interfaces with the street, the sidewalk, the public realm, and also with the adjacent residential neighborhoods. So this is really a, an important way of codifying the vision for the district and ensuring that developments contribute to that vision. Um, under this uh, proposed process, um, we, would, we would expect and, and propose that the, the process works the same way that it does today, um, whereby the both development under the zoning ordinance, the, the zoning overlay is permitted, um, as well as zoning under a PUD is permitted. But the, the idea here is to make the underlying zoning or the, the overlay zoning more uh, compatible with kind of the current market demands and market preferences, because that's actually an easier process for developers to go through. A PUD is a more complex and complicated process with a lot of additional upfront costs. And so there's a, there's a benefit both for developers and for the city to have a zoning code that matches um, some of the market preferences that are in place so that developers aren't forced into the PUD. And from the benefit of the city, it means that those, those um, those zoning overlays provide that sort of consistent and predictable urban form. And each, process, each project isn't subject to its own review and its own review criteria. So it, 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 it gives a much more consistent um, approach to development into how developments are reviewed. So in order to begin to um, achieve those goals and address uh, what are perceived as some of the shortcomings um, in the current uh, uh, overlay guidelines, um, we've, we've begun to for formulate the development standards um, through a very intensive and iterative process of, of engagement with um, elected officials, city staff, and the steering committee um, that, that, that David was mentioning earlier. And so we'd like to go through those, uh, those uh, draft um, development standards now. So one of the very first uh, and, and most important aspects of this that we wanted to look at was actually revising the boundaries of the district. So currently there are two overlay districts in play and it was deemed um, through our uh, engagement that that really didn't make a lot of sense and that it was more desirable to consolidate those into one district um, with one sort of consistent set of guidelines and standards. And also there was a desire looking at um, potential future development opportunities to expand the district. So the current uh, district that we're gonna be talking about tonight, it actually, uh, goes from the, the alley that's east of City Hall, which is on this property here, on the east side, all the way to the center line of Brentwood Boulevard on the west. And then it goes from Maryland Avenue on the north 
down to Forsyth, and then at Central, it comes down to Crondelet. So this is the property, this is the, um, half of this is the, the city parking or the um, county parking lot across from the government center. And then on the corner here, you have World News and you have the, um, the uh, Bank of America building. And then it comes uh, currently as, it, as the boundaries do around where the uh, Cafe Napoli property is. So what we're talking about tonight um, only applies to the parcels within this boundary and it is slightly expanded um, from the current boundary. The other important thing is that the, the boundary was expanded to include um, the Ceylon property, which is currently excluded because it was developed as a PUD, as well as um, the Forsyth Point property, which was, is also currently excluded because it was approved as a PUD. So in the future, um, were those projects to be redeveloped for some reason or another, um, those, those parcels would be included uh, within these guidelines. So the development standards um, uh, consist of a couple of key components. We look at building placement, which is how the building is located on the parcel. Um, we look at building height, um, both a minimum height, a maximum height, and then height ranges for each of the floors so that there's some consistent predictability in the way buildings are formatted. We look at encroachments, which is the ability for elements of the building facade to actually extend out over the public right of way. That could be things like awnings, canopies, or balconies. Um, building use requirements for both ground floor and upper floor, uh, parking and building service. And then we begin to identify some characteristic building types and frontage types, which again, begin to look at the character of the built environment and how it interfaces with the public realm. So in terms of building placement, um, the main change from the current uh, overlay district is that we are specifying a build to line as opposed to a setback line. What this means is that the build to line is, is a specific dimension um, at which the facade is required to be placed, measured from the parcel boundary. And because of the urban, walkable, commercial nature of this district, um, that build two line is set at zero feet on all primary streets, which is really all streets within the district. And that's indicated by this heavy dashed line. So all buildings are required to have a, a zero lot line uh, condition built right to the sidewalk. This ensures that consistent kind of building, uh, building frontage and, 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 and sense of enclosure within the streets. And then in order to allow for articulation, um, ground floor facades can be set back up to 12 feet for a maximum of 25% of the total facade length and upper floors 12 feet for a maximum of 60 feet or 50% of the total facade length. So, there is the um, built in the opportunity to um, have portions of the building set back for entrances and other features. So we don't want these buildings just to be extruded, extruded blocks. Um, and then setbacks are applied um, to what are considered the side, uh, the side lot lines, which are where lots abut one another, and then the alley lot lines in the back. And so um, it's a, for the side, it's zero feet to five feet, zero feet minimum to five feet maximum. And on the alley, it's zero feet minimum to 15 feet maximum. So what this is basically saying is that the entire footprint of the parcel is, is buildable. Um, so for a large format building that might have structured parking on the ground floor, um, the entire uh, area of the parcel is, is buildable. And the, the limits of, of where you can set back are also limited to, to that five feet or that, or that 15 foot maximum. So that's important because, you know, as you think of walking along, for instance, North Central, um, the, the most amount of space that you could have between two buildings on, on separate parcels would be 10 feet. So that's a, that maintains that consistency where you don't have gaps in the in the commercial storefronts. And then um, furthermore, 
when we look at the, um, the primary street build two lines, the building form specifies that at least 85% of that length must be built. So again, um, ensuring that there is that, that consistent um, street wall and, and, and relationship where we don't have gaps, big gaps between buildings. Um, throughout the district, um, the minimum building height is three stories. So all buildings that would be built would have to be a minimum of three stories tall or 40 feet. Um, this is again designed to, um, you know, uh, re reduce or eliminate building a one story building that doesn't fit within the urban character of the area. And then maximum building heights are orchestrated by block. So the blocks that you see here in red, which um, front Maryland Avenue directly across from um, the resident, the old town residential neighborhood, the, 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 the northern half of those blocks, the maximum building height would be limited to 10 stories or 140 feet. And for all the rest of the parcels in the area, the ones indicated in purple, um, the maximum building height of those uh, that, that could be built on those parcels is 25 stories or 300 feet. And so for example, um, when you look at uh, a building like the uh, Maryland Walk uh, apartment tower that's at the corner, at the northeast corner of Brentwood in Maryland, um, that, that building is uh, approximately 25 stories tall. It's a slightly less than uh, 300 feet, about 280 feet. And then further defining the, the building massing are required upper floor step backs. So what this means is that above a certain height, um, the, 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 the building facade would be required to be set back by a minimum distance. And so um, this, this, these upper floor step backs are really um, organized according to uh, broader relationships with, within each street. And we, we sort of took a street by street approach to make sure that the buildings, that new development has a contextual relationship to key landmarks um, on those streets. And also making sure that we're maintaining uh, appropriate views and vistas from other parts of downtown and from adjacent downtown neighborhoods. So all, all setbacks, as you see when we go through, are required to occur beginning above floor six. So the building can be built up to six stories in height. And then at the seventh story, um, any floors seven stories and higher would be required to be set back. So along North Central or North and South Central Avenue, which you see in red here, um, the required upper floor step back is 40 feet um, beginning above floor six or 80 feet from the ground. Um, along Forsyth Boulevard, which you see in pink, um, there's a 50 foot required step back beginning above floor six or 80 feet. That is, um, uh, calibrated to, to basically match the setback of the St. Louis County Police Headquarters building, which is a, a key landmark along Forsyth. Um, along Maryland Avenue, uh, where we see in blue here, those buildings would be required to be set back 60 feet above six stories. Uh, again, to mitigate that height right along, along uh, Maryland and provide a, a transition into the residential neighborhood to the north. And then along uh, North Bemiston Avenue, what you see in yellow, um, those upper floors would be required to be set back 70 feet. And that matches the, the setback of City Hall from, uh, from the street, uh, again, which is a, a key uh, landmark within that street. And then there are specifications, I won't go through these in detail, but for finished ground floor level, ground floor heights and ceiling, uh, ground floor ceiling heights and upper floor ceiling, ceiling heights to make sure that buildings have a consistent alignment. And so when we begin to look at the, at the implications of this from a massing standpoint, um, here you see outlined in the black dashed outline, this is basically the area that we're, that we're looking at these, uh, these development standards for. So we see some of the existing uh, 
maximum building heights that are permitted by adjacent zoning districts. You've got the uh, high density commercial, um, some of the residential districts as you move to the north. So this is basically showing a three story minimum building height. Then we have a six story, which is the maximum no step back height. And then finally, a maximum height transitioning from 10 stories uh, in this first half block off of Maryland up to 25 stories moving towards downtown. So looking at that more from the west, again, you see the minimum height of three stories, the maximum no step back height of six stories, and then the maximum overall height of 10 stories up to 25 stories. So we feel that this um, does a good job of balancing um, the desire for larger uh, property, larger projects, um, making projects uh, economically feasible for a developer, um, making sure that at you know, three stories, even small parcels can be uh, redeveloped incrementally or individually. Um, but that as projects get bigger, there is a, a contextual um, step, back, step down from the, 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 the higher density of downtown south of Forsyth, stepping down towards Maryland and then transitioning into uh, the adjacent residential neighborhoods to the north. And when we begin to look at that in terms of kind of the specific projects and, and how the city is currently built, um, again, this is the minimum height. And you can see here the Forsyth Point development modeled um, as an example and the Ceylon development. So the minimum height of three stories, the maximum no step back height of six stories, and then the maximum height of, of uh, 10 stories transitioning into 25 stories. In terms of the encroachments um, on the primary streets, we are recommending a six foot maximum encroachment. Um, this allows for a, a usable and occupiable uh, balcony or uh, canopy or overhang at the sidewalk level for outdoor dining. Um, and then in terms of the ground floor uses, uh, we are recommending that um, entertainment and dining um, be the primary ground floor use throughout the district in addition to primary retail. But primary retail would be permitted as a conditional use only on all buildings fronting um, North Central because that is envisioned as the primary dining and entertainment street within the district. And then upper floor uses would include secondary retail or service. Um, office uses and residential. And then finally, looking at parking and building service, um, the recommendation is that all parking would be located in the interior of the blocks. Um, it would be required, any parking that's at grade or above grade would be required to be set back a minimum of 60 feet from the build to line. So this allows for a commercial or retail unit um, to basically line any, any parking or any parking structure so that you don't have parking lots that are directly abutting or visible from the, from the sidewalk uh, in order to maintain that, that commercial uh, streetscape character. And then all access um, is is recommended to occur from the alley itself with the conditions that if the parcels to be developed have access to an alley or but an alley, um, the parking would be required to occur from the, from the alley. And if in the event that parcels don't have access to an alley, um, the access can occur from the street with the conditions that you would have no access on North Merrimack, North Central, South Central, or North Bemiston, which are really the kind of primary, these North South streets are the primary walkable, 
commercial streets. Um, so that would mean that access would have to occur either from Maryland, Forsyth, or Crondelet. And no access could be provided within 60 feet of a street corner. So again, we want to make sure that street corners are treated as special conditions um, really focused on on, on uh, commercial or, or entertainment um, and dining uses. And then we've also begun to um, identify a series of building types, building typologies that could be built in the area. Um, in our recommendations, we have more detailed um, specifications about these building types, but we've identified six live work buildings, flex buildings, commercial block buildings, high rise buildings, live work buildings and liner buildings, liner buildings being those buildings that would front a parking structure. And again, additional detail about those can be found in the presentations that will be on the website. And then in terms of frontage types, um, we've also identified six frontage types. Um, these are um, specific uh, design elements that are uh, applicable to different types of uses, both residential and commercial. And so they include uh, residential stoops, awnings and canopies, balconies, shop fronts, bay and oriel windows and cafes. And the, 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 the development standards um, recommend that each building must feature at least one frontage type on the ground floor and at least one frontage type on the upper floor, um, but can also feature multiple frontage types beyond that. And so again, the idea here is to provide a variety of building design elements and articulation um, that begin to define how the private space of the building interacts and interfaces with the public space of the street um, to provide visual interest texture and character of buildings um, and ensure that we don't just have kind of sealed extruded uh, blocks um, with, with, with none of those elements that help to contribute to that sense of vibrancy and that sense of character that this district uh, currently has and that historical development currently has had. So that concludes the presentation of the um, development standards. I want to touch quickly on the design guidelines. And um, these will be provided uh, in detail on the website for review. But the design guidelines um, basically deal with uh, these following nine uh, categories. So we talk about the objectives and definitions, then there are design excellence principles, um, district guidelines um, dealing with the overall um, kind of public space vision, as well as the interface between public space and private development within the district as a whole. Then there are architectural guidelines um, dealing with the overall design articulation and features of buildings. Uh, building elements and materials, getting into some uh, very specifics, uh, very specific recommendations or guidelines about those. Um, guidelines for landscaping, uh, public art and placemaking, environmental design, and then a series of land use tables, which would which will key the the current land uses with the zoning code and 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 relate those to to land use categories um, that are part of the, uh, the development standards and design guidelines. And the overall objective of these design guidelines is to achieve design excellence um, and a vibrant, attractive, and human-scaled um, downtown district. Um, and they're, they're designed and they're, they're um, uh, intended to make sure that projects have a distinctive character in their design and construction um, that contributes positively to that identity of the district, uh, provides that human scale pedestrian oriented experience, and encourages a variety of architectural um, contextuality, creativity, and diversity um, within the district so that you don't just have um, 
sort of large uh, buildings that are very repetitive at the ground level, but rather maintain that, that character that, that creates um, a, a vibrant district. So that concludes um, our presentation tonight. Again, just to reiterate the next steps of the process, um, we'll be collecting feedback tonight. Um, using that feedback, we will be working with the city to develop um, the final draft of the design, uh, the development standards design guidelines. Um, those will be presented back to the elected officials of the city. And then ultimately, as part of the adoption process, a public hearing will be conducted um, along with a, a, a review and comment period. Um, and so there, there will be more opportunities uh, to provide input on these, but we wanted to provide um, an, an, an overview of this tonight. I know, know it was a lot of information uh, to, uh, to get through, but we'll be happy to answer any questions. And I think some of the some of the key things that we might want to consider uh, that you might want to consider as you're um, offering your thoughts or asking questions. Um, the the question of the building height, um, minimum and maximum building heights, how those vary in different parts of the district, where those points of transition or change occur. Um, also, upper floor step backs and 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 how the overall massing um, of the of the um, buildings can occur within the development standards. Um, the desired character of key streets, North Central, Maryland, Forsyth, um, and any other questions and comments that, that you may have. So uh, thank you very much um, and would like to open it up for the Q&A. All right, thank you, Tim. I, I tell you what, what we'll do is I'll, I'll call out anyone that raises their hand um, and also read the questions that are in the question and answer box. Tim and John with H3 Design Studio, can answer questions related to this presentation. Um, I do apologize at the beginning, I didn't properly introduce myself. I'm David Gibson, the city manager of the city of Clayton. Uh, and then we do have with us this evening, uh, Carrie Cranford, our planning technician. She's running the Zoom for us. So if you do raise your hand um, to ask your question using audio, she can move you over or at least unmute you uh, so that you can ask that question. And we also have Susan Ice Tennis with us, who's our Director of Planning and Development Services. And Susan can answer any questions uh, related to current zoning that's in place uh, or any type of zoning history uh, that you may be curious about. So uh, with that, I'll open it up for question and answer. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and just start with the question and answer box here. Uh, the first question on here, do the landscape guidelines refer to sustainability and the use of native plant materials, tenements, water usage, et cetera. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, so they 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 will include um, those uh, those elements um, as well as um, as well as guidelines regarding. Um, uh, re requirements for landscaping and private developments, um, uh, and as well as um, uh, public public realm landscaping. Um, but but yes, the 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 um, the concepts of sustainability, native plantings, um, th those those are absolutely part of the the landscape uh, guide. <laughs> And to add to that, I think it's important that um, part of this will be coordinating with the city's overall sustainability and landscape uh, condition. So one of the things we have still got to do is get that coordination and that linkage uh, working better than it is at the moment. So we've got some work to be doing with the advisory groups on, on that. All right, thank you. The next question. Is it to be expected that developers would always build to the minimum height allowed? Yes. And the, the purpose of having a minimum height is so you don't build one story buildings effectively in the middle of your downtown. So, <clears throat> and you keep that, uh, the smaller buildings, which are two to three stories. So, yes. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, next question. Could the public art guidelines include recommendations for murals as part of the public art in downtown Clayton? 
I think this is a similar answer to the first one in terms of sustainability and landscape. Uh, we're wanting to ensure full coordination with the public art uh, recommendations in there. <clears throat> and this will also tie into the placemaking uh, components. And I'll also mention to anyone that's been following uh, recent conversations in the city, uh, we did have a conversation, um, well, there have been multiple conversations at the Public Art Advisory uh, Committee, at the Architectural Review Board, and also at the Board of Aldermen about murals. So we're still doing some more research on that. There's, there's, there's a lot to it on the regulatory side. Um, so we're going to have further discussion with the Board of Aldermen, and anything that may be put in place uh, as far as murals are concerned, we'll make sure that that's consistent uh, between both our ordinances or our regulations and this particular document upon its completion. Um, the next question here, does this plan allow for a widening of the sidewalks and removal of one car lane to maximize pedestrian traffic and restaurant offerings for outside dining? This, uh, uh, this is a very interesting question um, for two reasons. One, these guidelines apply to private property only, not necessarily to the right of way, which is under public uh, ownership. However, the regulations have, uh, and in the conversations to date, we have recommended that sidewalk widening occur as part and parcel of that. So, which is really important relative to fostering that sense of vitality. So our guidelines will incorporate ground level recommendations for the relationship of the building to the sidewalk. And we have uh, separate recommendations uh, on the design of the right of way. They are not part of the actual code. Right, ultimately, um, and David, you can correct me if I'm misstating this, but ultimately it would be the responsibility of, of the city to um, develop and adopt uh, an, an updated uh, streetscape standard for one or more particular corridors within the within the study area that, 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 that may incorporate those widened sidewalks. Is that correct? That's correct. We do have a standardized streetscape uh, for any projects, um, uh, new projects, but uh, we do not have a well-defined corridor plan as far as streetscapes and, and cross sections are concerned at this point in time. And I don't know if Susan Istennis has anything to add to that or not, but. This is Susan. No, I, I don't. That is uh, one of the things that um, need to be uh, fleshed out as, as part of this process um, per the recommendations of H3. So we will be looking at that um, as part of this process. Great, thank you, Susan. All right, the uh, next question on here, are these public art guidelines going to the PAAC or Public Art Advisory Committee for review and recommendation? Uh, to date, uh, we have not sent those to the, the PAC, um, but that's certainly not a bad idea and, and something I'm writing down at this moment. So um, we can certainly send that over to them for their feedback. Um, but even though we, we didn't show those here this evening, uh, as, as Tim had stated, we will have um, a link provided so you can look at those design guidelines, uh, but it is a, a, a very general guideline, I would say at that, um, but we will have, um, I, I think that's good. We can send that along to the PAC for their consideration. I think we may have lost David. Uh, looks like his screen might have froze. That's, that's what I was got, thinking. Um, there's a question on here about from Becky Patel. I am curious about the zero foot build two line. How, how does that support something like a patio? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, so the zero uh, build to line can be modified by the frontage types that um, Tim was suggesting. I don't know, Tim, if you could pull the frontage types up. Yeah. And there's normally a regulation <clears throat> on how much of 
the frontage types uh, can be as a proportion. So as an example, if you looked at 1.7.6, uh, the cafe, you can see that the building in fact can be set back for a patio or um, uh, a shop front, et cetera. So there are, the whole point is that it's, again, this texture is allowed and modification is allowed with on those. So you, you create that opportunity for diversity um, and adjustment uh, by the individual developers along, along the way. That's a very important uh, part of these regulations is that we're not just wanting to create something that is uniform block after block after block. We're expecting the developers and building in this flexibility um, that they can adjust and change in order to uh, create that. Yeah, and just to further on what John John just said, in a, in addition to those um, setbacks that are allowed uh, by the frontage types, um, we're also recommending that uh, a, a portion of the facade um, can be set back, uh, and and the current um, recommendation on, on that is that at the ground floor up to 25% of the facade can be set back up to 12 feet. And that would be, um, th that, that would not be uh, an, an, an overhanging or an inset condition as, as it's shown in like the cafe uh, frontage type with, with building overhead, but that could actually be a, uh, you know, an, an, an articulation of the building where a portion of the building is, is pushed back uh, and to accommodate an open air. And the other, the other op, uh, implication of this is if you look at the building typology, there's some buildings that you're allowed to have courtyards and things like that as well. So the, the articulation of the building is, uh, is uh, certainly an option <clears throat> as well. Okay, and I apologize for the Zoom difficulties here. Um, it dropped, I'm back on. Uh, was that the question related to the height of the Ceylon building? Or would be, that be the next question up here? That would be oh. the next question, David. Okay. David, Cheryl Miller's had her hand up for a little bit. Um, Feel free wanna... to That would be great. Okay, I'm going to let her talk. Hi, Cheryl. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, uh, thank... Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you yes. for the opportunity to talk. Um, I love the idea of all of the um, parking being interior and having no um, access to those main streets like um, Central and Merrimack and Bemiston. I think that's a great idea. Um, for, I'm a frequent walker downtown, both by myself and with my dog, and I feel like I'm often taking my life in my hands. Um, I do have two um, questions. Number one, will there still be street parking? And number two, what about buildings that um, currently have parking underneath their buildings that will exit not through an alley? Um, yes, they, they will remain street parking. Um, these regulations do not change that street parking. Um, existing buildings as they stand, are, are grandfathered into anything in typical and only um, when they get redevelopment, redeveloped beyond a certain percentage do they normally fall under the new regulations. Okay. So that would be a way that would handle transition. So it's, it's trying to be fair to developers if for instance, they did some minor work outside, you know, you, they, they don't have to then bring their full building up to these new codes, but if they were doing substantial renovation and expansion of the building, yes, they would then do it. So there's just a subtle difference in, in that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next question. What is the current height of the Ceylon building relative to the maximum height allowed um, of the proposed change, maximum allowed height of the proposed change? So the Ceylon building um, is a, a five-story building. Um, 
And it is, it's basically four stories of, uh, of residential units um, over a, a ground floor commercial um, that, that fronts uh, an interior parking, a single level parking structure. Um, so it would fall within that range of the non step back maximum height um, of three stories to six stories. So again, a three story, uh, three story minimum building height throughout the district, six story maximum building height before an upper floor step back is required. So one, one can think of this, the Ceylon building as kind of a, a typical, um, typical of what that, that base building, that non-step backed height um, would, would be. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, next question, does the patio need to be recessed under the building as depicted in graphic 1.7.6? No, not at all. That's one example. And again, just sort of going to what we mentioned before, a certain percentage of the building can be set back from the zero building line. That space can be a patio. You can make a courtyard building. That space could be a patio. And then, of course, we have recommended that within an expanded um, sidewalk uh, area, there should be some designated zones, in fact, for outdoor dining. So again, trying to have multiple options available to the developer to foster that sense of um, the entertainment district. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, that is, those are all the questions in the question and answer box. Uh, and I don't see any hands up. Does anyone have any additional questions? Okay, not seeing any. Last call for questions. Okay, I still don't see any movement. So uh, as we've stated with the next steps, uh, we will take the recording of this presentation. Uh, we will put a link to that recording on the city's website. We'll also have a, an open comment period. Uh, so if you have neighbors or for uh, other parties you that you think would be interested in this material, there's an opportunity for them to give their comments. Uh, then we will go. Uh, we'll get back together. Staff will get back together uh, with H3 Design Studio uh, to work on these draft design guidelines. And when those are packaged and ready, they'll go to the Plan Commission and also the Board of Aldermen for, for uh, further consideration. And then, of course, there will be another public hearing and another comment opportunity uh, as this uh, goes through the formal process. So that concludes our presentation in the question and answer session this evening. And I wanna thank uh, certainly our presenters here from H3 Design Studio uh, and everyone that joined us this evening. So thank you all very much. Have a thank great you. night. David, real quick, I just wanted to, I wanted to correct for the record something. I, I misspoke about Ceylon. It's actually a six story overall height, not a five story overall height. Great, thank you for the clarification. All right, that concludes our presentation this evening. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Just good night. Bye-bye.